What is up, my Barnon Nation? This is Chris, a.k.a. Barnon11970, and as always, I thank you guys for taking the time to check out my video. All right, guys, for those of you who've been subscribed to my channel for a while, you guys know that uh, one of the jobs that I have left at this point is I am a licensed massage therapist. I've been licensed doing massage. Uh, well, I've been licensed since um, Halloween of 1995, and I've been doing massage since January 23rd of 1996. So couple of months that uh, have gone by since then. Um, I was actually in my mid-20s, and now I'm in my early 40s. Go figure. But uh, I was doing a massage today on an elderly woman, probably in her late 60s, early 70s, I'm not sure, and she complained about getting headaches. So it actually inspired me to be able to uh, give some more helpful information to people um, that are trying to reduce the amount of medications they're on. Um, what I'm going to show you is natural cures for almost every type of headache, uh, whether it be a tension headache or whether it's from just stress. Um, as far as a migraine headache, those are a little bit more different because those a lot of times are about chemical imbalances and People that get migraines that are reg on a regular basis, once they get them, there's not much you can do. But the one uh, benefit of somebody that gets migraines frequently, if you consider anything a benefit, is the fact that they usually can tell when it's about to happen. So if you do these techniques before the onset of a migraine, you may not always be able to stop it, but you can reduce the severity and you can s speed up the process of getting it over with because some people can have migraines that last up to 24 hours to the point where they can't even stand daylight. That's how bad some people's migraine headaches can get. So the majority of this will be for people who just get the regular everyday kind of headaches and don't want to rely on any pain medications or even aspirin because as much as the uh, medical field wants to try and convince you that aspirins are good for your heart, and I'm not going to suggest that it's not, but what they don't tell you is it can be very bad for your stomach and your liver if you use it too often. And there are plenty of people out there, especially if you have a stressful job or stressful life and you're a person that likes to just pop pills, eventually you start, your body starts breaking down because the body sees it as toxins. So I'm going to show you a couple of pressure points and something that you could use that's all natural that pretty much will almost within 30 seconds, get rid of any normal headache and help you deal with a migraine. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you some pressure points. Basically what pressure points are, um, you have nerves that travel throughout the body and nerves do not have, like for example, an extension cord where it just goes from one position to another. Uh, there are gaps in between certain points and they're called synapses. A synapse is basically a little area where the one nerve stops and there's a little bit of water because water is a uh, has the ability to have be a current for electricity, and then it basically zaps across and continues on. So that's why if you've ever gone to an acupuncturist, that's where they're sticking the needles. It's such a precise thing that you really need to go to a, a professional that knows what they're doing. I specialize in pinpoint therapy, which is basically acupuncture without needles. So what you're doing is, is you're focusing on that little spot where the synapse is, the little space in between the nerve endings. And if you could put pressure or use a needle when you're doing acupuncture, you can actually stop the flow of electricity current to an area. That's why if you've ever heard of people getting acupuncture and being able to be operated on without going under any anesthetic, because what's happening is you're stopping the pain signals to the brain. So this is not magic or voodoo or you know, some kind of superstition. This is actual science and uh, anatomy. So if you get any kind of major headaches, the majority of them tend to come from this day and age from the computer generation. Because when you're on a computer, especially if it's a job or you're a, a video gamer who is spending hours at a time, what do you tend to do? You tend, to, if you're a typist and working on computers, you tend to be like this all day and your head is in one position, your arms are straight out, and your fingers are constantly moving. So you're not getting a lot of circulation in the neck, and a lot of times you're bending forward. With a video gamer, you tend to be hunched over. You tend, again, your arms out, again, staring in one position for hours at a time. 
So this is what's called an RMI, which is repeated motion injury. It's doing the same thing over and over again. And more people will actually affect their body in a, in a more hurtful way when they do RMIs as opposed to a major injury right away. And I'll explain the reason why. Let's say, for example, just out of an example, if you come home, and I don't hope this ever happens, but if you come home and as soon as you open the door, all of a sudden, two seconds after you walk in the house, you see the cabinet door in your kitchen sink burst open and you see water gushing out. In other words, a pipe broke. Now, because you notice that right away and it's something that you know is going to cause damage, you're going to work on that as fast as you can to repair it. So even though there might have been a big gush of water, you are basically limiting the amount of damage it does because you react to it right away. So it may cause the initial damage, but you're going to stop it as much as you can by reacting to it. Now, if you take this other scenario, let's say you have just a little drip underneath the sink that you don't even know is there. And it drips once a minute, but it's all the way in the back of the cabinet where all, and all your things that you put down there are blocking it. You don't even know it's there. That particular drip, one drip isn't going to do anything. But if you're talking a year, five years, 10 years, 15 years of that nonstop dripping, one day you will go to open your cabinet and basically the whole floor will collapse in because it turned into sawdust. So little things that accumulate tend to cause more damage. So if, for example, if you were walking down the street and all of a sudden there was a loud noise behind you and you turn around and you really injure your neck and it's killing you, something like that will make you say, you know what, I better go to a doctor because now my neck is in pain. I can't move. I want to fix it. But something like a computer, you're not sitting there while you're on a computer, at least when you're starting out saying, oh my God, this is killing me. I can't do this. You don't really feel anything. So it's a little bit over and over again. And what happens is the muscles on the back of the neck, which are basically keeping your head forward, they connect. Let me see if I can do this. They connect to the back here. Let me take the hat off so you could see better. There we go. So you're going to see right here a curve. Hopefully I can't see the screen. But if you see this, if you take the center of this, this is called the occipital ridge. If you start from this area right here, where the, you could feel a little bump in the bone. It's almost like a kind of a horseshoe kind of shape. And you go about a quarter of the way down, you'll feel two bumps on the occipital ridge. Those are pressure points that you can actually work to relieve some headaches, especially if you're getting them around the frontal lobe or around the eyes. So you can massage all in this area, again, right along the occipital ridge, just follow the curvature of the bone. Press on it. Um, if you have fingernails, just make sure you use the palms of your fingers. Don't use the nails because you don't want to be scratching yourself. And you don't want to apply too much pressure, just enough to kind of do some circular motions for about a minute, minute and a half to get some of the circulation. So that's one of the pressure points. Another pressure point you'd never really think of when it comes to uh, a headache. And that pressure point is right here in the palm. This particular pressure point, you kind of squeeze it from both ends. See if you could see from here to here. And you kind of just work this area, the webbing between this finger and your thumb. Press in and just do, again, a little bit of a circular motion because you want to create a flow of energy. Now, this is also a karate pressure point. So you don't want to press too hard because this can be incredibly painful. So you want to be very careful about that. But again, for about a circular motion, for about a minute, minute and a half, maybe two minutes, you work each hand. And again, as you see, the webbing between the thumb and the finger right in here. Oh, nice little cut. Oh, damn cats. All right, so that's number two. The third one, obviously, it's actually funny because when people get headaches, you naturally tend to grab this particular area of your head and you don't even realize it. Most people, when they're getting like a migraine, a really bad headache, what do they tend to do? They tend to be like this. Now, this actually is a natural pressure point. If you go right, basically you take to the bridge of your nose, go in a little bit towards the eyes, right where the eyebrows are, right below them, and you kind of go up and in, only hitting the bone. Obviously, you don't want to poke your eyes, but this is an area... And you find it funny because most people, when they get headaches, what do they do? They're like this. 
So they actually naturally gravitate to this one particular pressure point. So all three of these are definitely going to help. Now, here's the um, natural, um, I can't even say medicine, but the ma natural way to actually alleviate a headache. Now, this right here, see if you could see it. And I'll cover the name because I'm not trying to promote anything. This is essential oil. It's natural peppermint oil. Now, you could find this stuff. I get my um, in bulk. I buy a bunch of these things. Obviously, I do aromatherapy at my massage office. But um, you could get it on eBay or you could just Google essential or peppermint essential oils. You don't want anything other than essential oils. Essential oils are nothing but the particular product. There'll be some that are lemon, lime, orange, vanilla, spearmint, peppermint. Each one will have different things. Lavender, rosemary, eucalyptus. Eucalyptus is great for breathing problems. So if you have asthma, that is a great area to take a little bit of eucalyptus and menthol and rub it against your chest. That's why if you've ever been to a sauna, you'll always get that, like when they clean it, they have that interesting kind of cleanly smell. They don't use bleach. Well, at least they're not supposed to. Most of the time they use eucalyptus. But what you're going to do is, and you only need about three drops. Now, this is a, I think, 0.5 ounce bottle. It will run you, depending on what, what website and how many you get, but it'll probably run you about $7 or less. If it's any more than $7, they're charging you too much. But you only need about three or four drops so you just place them on your hand and all you have to do is just wipe it across your forehead. Big thing, do not let it get in your eyes. And as soon as you wipe it on your forehead, wash your hands. Because I'm going to tell you right now, if this peppermint oil, which is nothing but pure peppermint oil, goes into your eyes, you're basically going to know what it feels like to be pepper sprayed. You don't want to feel that. It may help you not think about the headache, but definitely going to add to your problem. So you don't want that. So please make sure you wipe your hands and only use one or two drops because you want enough just to smear across your forehead. And you will see within less than 30 seconds, you'll get that York peppermint patty feeling. You'll get this very chilling, soothing kind of sensation. And because it's all natural, Unless you have allergies, which I would recommend you check just to make sure, it's not going to do anything harmful to you. It's nothing but beneficial. Peppermint oil can even be used in tea, if you want to drink tea, or even use this as a breath mint. So this is consumable because, again, pure peppermint oil. So that should help you with headaches. Now, again, if you get migraines, the idea is to do these pressure points and apply this essential oil before you start getting the migraine and it can stop it or at least reduce it or speed up the, the recovery time. It may not stop it completely because again, it depends on the chemical imbalances that the person has and how often they get them. Um, and once it's pretty much set in, you pretty much can't do anything. So this won't help cure it, but it can kind of help relieve some of that tension. So I'm going to show you two other things. These are simple massage techniques. Um, the second thing right now that I'm going to talk about is TMJ. I'm going to just put some of that peppermint oil on, and I'm going to make sure I do not touch my eyes. TMJ problems, especially in women. The reason it happens in women more often than men is because men, when they're angry, they tend to be more physical. They want to punch something, so they kind of hold back. So they tend to feel a lot of their stress in their shoulders. When it comes to women, women... On average, of course, there are always exceptions. Women tend to be more verbal. In other words, they want to talk about things um, or they want to fight. And sometimes when they want to verbally fight somebody, sometimes they just hold back. So they're kind of like, mm. so they grind your teeth. So in this area, especially people that have really bad TMJ, their jaws can click. Uh, they can grind their teeth. And that happens a lot when people sleep. So if you grind your teeth in your sleep, you're actually ripping apart your teeth and destroying your enamel. So what you can do is you could press, basically you take the earlobe and right behind it, when you open and close the jaw, you will feel right in here, there's a muscle. Okay. It's the temp, um, what is it? The tempular mandibular joint it took me a second. And you also also have this muscle, which is the SCM or the sternocleidoid muscle. This attaches to the joint. So when you 
massage that area, press in. Again, if you have fingernails, be careful. But you press in on both sides just to loosen the area of the joint where the muscles attach from the neck. And then right in here, there's a muscle in your mouth that is responsible for chewing. And that, if it stays very tight, will be the reason why people have jaws that kind of have that either you get locked jaw or your jaw clicks or you grind your teeth. Now, the way to find it is if you kind of clench your teeth like you're about to chew something, you'll feel a muscle here tighten up. OK, that muscle, basically what you do is place your finger on the muscle, press in and just slide up and down. And you could do that again on both sides. Again, the best way to find it kind of clench a little bit and you'll feel it flex a little bit. Um, again, you only have to do this for maybe maybe about two to five minutes, but that will help increase blood circulation. So that will also help with your lymphatic system, which is your drainage. So that will help get out whatever is stuck in there. Um, after you do any of these massages, make sure you drink plenty of water because water will help thin out the blood, give better circulation. So not only will you get more nutrients into the area that you're working on, it will also get rid of through the lymphatic system, which is your drainage, all the stuff that's kind of been stuck in there. Now, stuff that's stuck is like lactic acid, um, used up nutrients that get stuck in the muscle. Because when people say things like, well, why does it get stuck? Basically, think of it like, for example, if you have a garden hose, if you have a garden hose and you squeeze that hose or bend that hose and you try and turn on the water, the water is not going to flow as easily. So just imagine if there was dirt going through that water and it was trying to get around that bend or where you're squeezing it, some of that's going to start getting stuck there. Now, and it, the best way to think of any muscle in the body is to think of it not like just one big slab of meat. Think of it like a couple of thousand rubber bands. They are elastic, they stretch, and they're supposed to be individual fibers. So think of a couple of thousand rubber bands that are all lined up perfectly next to each other that you use to pull from two different points. Now, over time, those rubber bands, instead of being straight across, can intertwine and intertangle, which if you have a bunch of rubber bands connected to each other and you try and pull them, it's going to lose its elasticity and its range of motion, which can create more injuries. Now, the, the way, the best way to think of it, adhesion, when waste products or lactic acid starts building up in those areas that are being basically squeezed together, think of it like taking a bunch of rubber bands, they intertwine with each other, and then you take a bunch of gum, stick it in between the rubber bands, and the, the gum tends to dry. Again, it's going to make it harder to increase your range of motion, more subjects to muscle pulls, strains, or injury. So... Basically, that's what an adhesion is. It's basically used up nutrients or lactic acid that builds up and it starts to solidify over time. That's why if you've ever gotten a deep tissue massage or you crack a knuckle you'll in the muscle, you'll feel like a gritty, grindy kind of feeling. That's basically breaking up of the adhesions. So again, you want to drink a lot of water. So another technique I want to show you is if a person has... Um, carpal tunnel or is a or is in the process of getting carpal tunnel now what is carpal tunnel carpal tunnel usually comes from people either doing a lot especially these days either a lot of texting or a lot of typing on a computer because what happens is you have little bones that are kind of like little circles in your hand they're called carpals and you'll have a nerve in the middle of your forearm that's called the median nerve and it goes into the palm of your hand so when you're bending that particular nerve is responsible for the signal to make your wrist bend. So what happens is the best way to describe carpal tunnel is think of it like taking a thing of dental floss and sticking it in between your teeth. What happens is the ligament gets stuck in between two of the carpals and gets caught. So those bones, every time you move them, they pinch on the nerve and it could be incredibly painful and could end a person's career. Massage therapists have to be very diligent about this stuff. If you have a job where you're using your hands a lot, in other words, if you do massage therapy, um, if you are somebody that works on a computer or you're somebody that's an architect and do a lot of drafting, um, these are things you want to be concerned about. And you don't want to wait until you already have a problem. The idea is to work a problem area before something becomes a, pro a problem. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So how can you do this? The first thing you can do, again, you just take your fingers and just work along right here along the wrist bone where it attaches to the carpals in the hand. And you kind of just work around the wrist, 
just a little bit of massage around the wrist to keep it loose. Now, a lot of other times people get these wrist problems, you could feel it in your elbow. Now, if you watch, when I flex my wrist back, you're going to see how this muscle right here in the elbow starts to flex. These are the flexor muscles for the hand to rise. Now, this area right here, if you've ever had problems and pain in this particular area, it's called lateral epicondylitis. In other words, another name for it that you'll be very familiar with is tennis elbow. Why they called it that is because when people were doing tennis, they would do this motion and they would be back with the backhand. The ball's coming this way and the wrist is going out. It's doing this motion. And as you see, again, when I bend the wrist, you'll see the elbow starts flexing. So it's not an elbow problem. It's actually a wrist problem. So you're going to feel the pain here. It's called referred pain. And that's why a lot of times when you have muscle aches and pains and you go to a doctor, just because you're feeling pain in a specific area of your body does not mean that that's where the pain originates from. So if you go to a doctor, for example, and you say, oh, I got a pain right here in the back of the neck, and it's actually originating somewhere in the back of your middle of your back, and it's sending a signal up the nerve pathway where it's being stopped here that's causing a pinch. Well, they can work on this all they want, and they can examine all they want. They're not going to find anything. So that's why a lot of times if you go to the doctor and say, well, I experience, I'm experiencing pain, and they just examine that particular area, they're not going to find anything, and they're just going to say, here, here's a bunch of painkillers. Well, painkillers do nothing but hide the problem and actually can make things worse. Because if you've ever seen like one of those arthritis commercials where they show like an elderly woman saying, oh, I get arthritis in my wrist and I take this such and such arthritis pill and I feel great. And what do they do? They go back to playing. Well, you haven't fixed the problem. You're just basically slowing down and stopping the signal of the pain sensation to the brain. So it's not registering the pain. You still have the injury. You're just not feeling it. So people that take a lot of pain medication and painkillers, they are not going to be healed. They're just not feeling the pain. So a lot of times people have the attitude of, oh, well, I feel fine. Let me go do such and such activity and actually injure yourself even worse or do some permanent damage. So you really have to be careful about that. So basically, you can also work along the forearm. And the way to find the muscle is every time you press, just slowly lift up your wrist and work all the way around to the attachment or the origin of this particular muscle. And again, you could work both sides because you, you want to work both parts of the muscle. So these will help with those kind of problems. And again, don't wait until you have it because once you have a carpal tunnel problem, even if you get an operation, you could be subject to multiple times of it falling back in again. So the idea is if you have a job where you know you're using your hand and forearms a lot, again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Another thing that you can do, if you know you're going to be doing a lot of typing, a lot of writing, a lot of drafting or whatever, what you can do is you can take your forearm and your wrist, fill your sink with as warm as water as you can tolerate. I mean, obviously don't burn yourself and just soak your forearm in that hot water for about a minute to three minutes. The longer, the better, but no more than 15 minutes at a time. And speaking of which, a lot of people, when they have back problems, they, they like to resort to heating pads. Now, heating pads are good things. But the problem is, if you're not educated in what you're doing, you can actually cause more harm than good to yourself. It's called drowning in good intention. Let me explain. They've done studies about how long you should keep a heating pad on a specific area of a muscle problem before it actually starts doing the opposite of what you want. And they find, on average, you want a heating bl a blanket or heating pad on an area no more than about 15 minutes. And let me explain why. The purpose of a heating pad is, let's say, for example, you have a sore elbow, because it's easier to, to show the elbow than my back, is, and you put a heating pad on it. The heat expands the blood vessels, which makes circulation better. So not only do you get more nutrients in, but also get more waste products out. So when you apply a heating pad somewhere on your body that's sore, that's what's helping to heal it faster because the heat is actually widening the blood vessels. And that's why in the wintertime, you tend to have lots of cold fingers and hands because the blood vessels actually thin out because of the cold. Now, I want you to think of the heating pad 
and opening the blood vessels, like having a farm and you are irrigating your crops. Now, if you open the floodgate so the water comes in to feed your crops, that's a beneficial thing. But what happens if you keep the floodgates open too long? Well, you flood all the vegetables and you kill them. So what they found is after about a 15 minute time, of course, you know, it's not an exact science, but on the average of about 15 minutes of time, if you apply that heating pad and keep it there, what will happen is after a while you start getting too much blood in that area. So the muscles start to thin out and you actually start getting less than even when you started. So somebody that goes to bed with a heating pad, they might feel very comfortable when they do it. They fall asleep and leave it on all night. If you've ever woken up stiff as all hell and sore, it's because of that particular situation. So you never want to go to bed with a heating pad. Obviously, a heating blanket is a little different because it's just laying on top of you. You're not like on, most people use heating beds for their backs so and they're laying directly on it. And what you also want to do is if you have a heating blanket and you're laying on it, a heating pad, put a little towel in between because you don't want the heat directly on your skin. So I'm going to leave it at that. This is almost a half hour video. Um, what I'm going to do for the time being, for obvious reasons, I am going to disable the thumbs up and thumbs down because it's just ridiculous what's going on at this point. So what I'm going to ask my subscribers and the people who appreciate this information, if you think this is beneficial and you appreciate the uh, stuff I'm giving you, and I'm going to have a lot more videos about like this down the line. Um, obviously you can't give it a thumbs up for the time being. I apologize for that, but I'm sure you understand why, but if you could favor it or share it, that to me would be, uh, very, very well appreciated. So for the time being, that's what it's going to be and, um, favoring it and sharing it, especially on your social networks for people that you think will benefit from this. Um, this will help me to be able to still get the message out and help people with this truthful information. And I'll continue to make more along the way. So I know this channel started originally out with just gold and silver, but I want to branch it out. And now I'm getting to the point. I want to start talking about alternative ways to heal your body, uh, better foods for yourself, uh, still the whole government stuff. I want this to be a well-rounded channel. So if you appreciate it, hit the favor button, hit the share button, and uh, leave your comments after the beep. So thanks a lot, guys. If you have any questions, leave a comment and have a wonderful day. And if you if, if this is your first time ever watching one of my videos, we would love for you to be part of the Barna Nation. Hit the subscribe button and uh, be part of the team. Thanks for watching again, guys. This is Chris signing off. Peace.